While the critical success of video game adaptations is always hit or miss, the potential for financial success means we'll keep getting them. They bring in star power like Jim Carrey in Sonic the Hedgehog, or The Rock in 2018's Rampage. The 1990s, however, gave us some video game adaptations that were less than stellar. Sometimes, a studio has a recipe for success that just seems so undeniable, the resulting failure is a complete shock. And this is certainly the case with 1994's Street Fighter. With huge stars, a decent budget, and source material known and loved worldwide, how could a movie that had so much promise become such a tremendous disappointment to critics and audiences alike? Well, if you've seen Street Fighter, you've probably asked, what the f**k happened to this movie? Let's start at the beginning. Edward Pressman was a producer with a hefty list of credits, including Das Boot, Masters of the Universe, Conan the Barbarian, and Wall Street. Some years, the guy had as many as five producing credits to his name. He's still doing his thing today, grinding away on a remake of The Crow for over a decade now. In 1993, Pressman caught wind of Japanese game publisher Capcom, known for video games like Ghosts and Goblins and Mega Man and Capcom was looking to adapt their extremely popular arcade game Street Fighter into a film franchise. Street Fighter had already taken the world by storm, selling millions of copies for home consoles and reinvigorating the arcade industry of the 90s. Now keep in mind, when Pressman heard about Street Fighter, there was only one previous video game adaptation, Super Mario Brothers. See you later, alligator! We're not gonna go there right now. Pressman saw a huge opportunity with Street Fighter, since the adaptation would have to be action-heavy, he recommended Steven D'Souza. When it came to writing action, D'Souza had an impressive resume with classics like Die Hard, 48 Hours, and Commando. Though Pressman was recommending him for writing and directing duties, which was new territory for D'Souza. Capcom agreed to hear a pitch from D'Souza, and they were sold. At the meeting, D'Souza made it clear that he thought a tournament-style movie was the wrong way to go, and Capcom agreed. They didn't think audiences would take a tournament storyline seriously. Little did they know that one year later, Mortal Kombat would hit theaters to great success. You have been chosen to defend the realm of Earth in a tournament called Mortal Kombat. Instead, the Street Fighter plot would focus on two sides, a totalitarian general dead set on world domination and a brave all-American hero who would stop him by any means. The rest of the characters would simply fall in line, choosing one of the two sides. Universal Pictures and Capcom would be making the movie with D'Souza at the helm and a budget of around $35 million, a fairly massive amount in Hollywood at the time. With that budget, there were a few snags. The biggest was that for Capcom to agree to terms, Street Fighter would have to be released by Christmas of 1994. That only gave D'Souza about 13 months to finish casting, shooting, editing, adding special effects, marketing, and releasing the film he had just pitched. The other main point of contention would be how many of the characters to include. Capcom wanted to see all of their characters in the film, but D'Souza argued that a dozen main characters would be too difficult to divide screen time. He asked the room if they were familiar with the Seven Dwarves, then asked who could name all seven, and not one person in the room could. D'Souza explained that the reason there were Seven Dwarves was that seven is the number of characters an audience can keep in its head at any time. Swept up in that moment, Capcom agreed to seven main characters. So the casting began. D'Souza's main priority was finding his hero and his villain, Guile and Bison. For the role of Guile, Capcom wanted a box office draw, and producers went after Jean-Claude Van Damme for the role. He had just been offered the role of Johnny Cage for Paul W.S. Anderson's adaptation of Mortal Kombat, and he turned it down to star in Street Fighter instead. The problem for the production was, at that time, Van Damme was well aware of his worth. In 1993, Jean-Claude Van Damme was basically the biggest action star in the world so his big name would have a big price tag attached to it, rumored to be about $8 million, almost a quarter of the film's entire budget. But that price tag was worth it. Van Damme was an incredible stunt fighter and martial artist. The only aspect missing in his performance was that all-American hero part. I'm gonna get on my boat, and I'm going up river, and I'm going to kick that son of a bitch bison's ass so hard that the next bison wannabe is gonna feel it. Now, who wants to go home, and who wants to go with me? $8 million well spent. The villain of the film was played by Raul Julia. A classically trained actor who had garnered national acclaim for his stage work, Julia was also well known for his roles in Kiss of the Spider-Woman, and of course, as Gomez Adams in The Adams Family. 
Julia brought quite a bit of levity to the role of Bison, and he filled the part physically as well, towering over Van Damme at 6 foot 2. But Julia didn't exactly have a cheap price tag either, so the remainder of the cast would be on a budget. D'Souza sought out lesser known talent with action experience to fill out the remaining supporting roles. After all, there were only five left, so it shouldn't have been too difficult. Until Capcom decided they wanted to add two more characters. It seems the charm of D'Souza's pitch of seven may have worn off. Every single time he'd turn in a draft of the script, he was asked to add another character. Then they'd ask for two more characters. Two became three, became five, until eventually the cast of seven main characters became a lead cast of 15. To be fair, it could have been worse. Capcom ultimately asked for 19 characters in the film before agreeing to a lower number. Still, 15 major characters, which meant additional casting, which meant reworking the script, which meant more delays. When the production requested an extension, they were denied. Capcom would not budge on their Christmas 1994 deadline. The quick casting dilemma and lack of funds ruined some dream casting that could have taken place, such as who was originally in mind for the role of Vega. The producers wanted Fabio. Yes, the model who, at the time, had graced the cover of every romance novel, fragrance ad, and margarine commercial in America. Producers saw this man as the quintessential choice for Vega. But alas, too much of the budget had already been used on Van Damme and Raul Julia. We as audiences can only imagine what he would have brought to the role. That is a big sword. Such a small boy. Put down your sword, boy. I have no taste for the blood of children. For the role of Ryu, Capcom was high on an actor named Kenya Sawada, who was already playing a similar character for Japanese commercials at the time. For Capcom, he would have been the perfect fit. But the part had already been filled by a young Chinese-American actor named Byron Mann, who at that point was already screen testing with actors auditioning for the role of Ken. Another issue with Sawada was his inability to play the part in a humorous way, which was essential for the banter between Ryu and Ken. Every draft of the script had humor in it, and it wasn't something D'Souza was interested in removing. Lastly, Sawada spoke very broken English. As a first-time director, D'Souza didn't have many options at his disposal, but he leaned into his strength as a writer, creating a new role for Sawada that was cleverly named Captain Sawada. Other primary roles were filled by Wes Duty, Damian Chapa, Ming-Na Wen, and Andrew Brynjarski. Another element to be dropped from the production was, stunningly, martial arts training. D'Souza felt that decent training for all actors would result in a smoother look for the fight sequences during production. Initially, the $35 million budget led him to believe this training would be possible. By the time production was ready to begin, Capcom had gotten its wish, with two big stars as the faces of the movie, but this meant D'Souza would have considerably less money to make the film. Still, filming began, even though casting wasn't finished. Before D'Souza left for production in Bangkok and Australia, he was informed that the Australian Actors Guild was intent to have an Australian in one of the major roles in the film. They reasoned that if you're going to shoot some scenes in Australia, they wanted an Australian actor in the film. The only vacant role at the time was Cammy. It was on his flight to Bangkok that D'Souza found himself flipping through magazines, furiously trying to find a star for this role. That's when he came across Kylie Minogue, who was on the cover of Australia's People magazine. She was a huge celebrity down under, as a pop star and as an actress with soap opera experience, which meant she knew how to memorize lines quickly. As soon as his plane landed, he made an appointment with Minogue to discuss the part, and within hours, she was hired. There were problems with Street Fighter as soon as production started. In Bangkok, many of the cast and crew were sick from the local cuisine and drinking untreated water. The line producer actually had a heart attack during filming and had to be replaced. Another producer forgot what side of the road he was supposed to be driving on, and turned into oncoming traffic colliding with a bus. An unnamed actor was busted, bringing steroids into Australia for the last portion of the film's shoot. The aspect of Street Fighter that stands out most, both behind the scenes and on screen, is that of Raul Julia. The actor brought a gravitas to the role of M. Bison that was unrivaled in every scene, even if it was occasionally campy. He saw a Shakespearean aspect to the character, one that was comparable to Richard III, Julia prepared for the physicality of the role by watching footage of dictators throughout time, and even mimicked many of their movements for his performance, most notably his hand gestures, which are very similar to those of Mussolini. But this was not an easy role for Raul Julia. Unknown to anyone at the time, the actor was fighting a losing battle to stomach cancer. When the cast met for the first time over dinner, some of the actors initially couldn't recognize who they were looking at, because he appeared very old and frail, a stark contrast to his appearance in the Adams family. Before filming began, Julia had undergone surgery for the cancer and had just finished chemotherapy. The production schedule was not organized in a way that would reflect the physical weakness and weight loss of the man playing its primary antagonist. 
Like most action films, the plan was to film the dialogue-heavy elements up front, allowing time for the stunt teams to choreograph and rehearse action sequences that would shoot later. But to Susan knew he couldn't show close-ups of Julia in this condition. So the shooting schedule was flipped with the action sequences filmed first, which would give Julia significant time to put on weight before his close-ups. His family was invited to spend time with him as he recovered, and his days at the start of production was very much like a family vacation. Spending time with his kids raised his body mass and his spirits. The switch to the shooting schedule was a stroke of genius for the performance of Bison, but maybe not so much for other aspects of filming. This new schedule meant that there was no time to rehearse action sequences, and Charles Picherny carried the brunt of that more than anyone else. D'Souza wanted to hire Picherny as the stunt coordinator for the film after seeing the incredible job he did on Die Hard. Picherny took the job and immediately requested to rehearse action sequences with actors months before filming began, but because of the film's rushed production, he met many of his actors for the first time on set. The first day of shooting had Ken and Ryu doing about 10 stunt takes. That normally requires a pretty decent amount of rehearsal time, and Picherny didn't get any with his actors or his crew. It was also later discovered that the martial arts trainer for the film was completely unfamiliar with the video game, and thus didn't know that the characters were each proficient in a different martial arts style. About halfway through the shoot, someone on set asked why everyone was fighting in the same way. Picherny at one point took on the role of second unit director, which saw him filming action sequences with minor talent and extras, while D'Souza focused on the dialogue scenes with the main cast. This was an attempt to power through as much of the script as quickly and efficiently as possible to hit the deadline. Picherny was understandably perturbed by the events. He didn't sign on to direct anything, and he certainly wasn't paid for the change in duties. Nevertheless, he shot what was requested of him, though he left out one major detail. Capcom insisted that the fight sequences include special moves for each character, just like the video game, and Picherny didn't shoot any of that. When D'Souza discovered those shots were missing, he and his stunt coordinator nearly came to blows on set, with Picherny threatening to leave the production. Had you worked together instead of against each other, you might have been successful. To solve the issue, D'Souza had to shoot those special moves later in production and splice them into scenes during editing, in some cases reshooting the fight scenes entirely. D'Souza had no experience filming action sequences, so any actor on set who had experience with martial arts, including Van Damme himself, often stepped in to help at the end of production. Speaking of Van Damme, we haven't talked nearly enough about him yet. As he himself admitted years later, this was not the best time in his life. For starters, his third marriage had just ended. He picked himself up, dusted himself off, and threw himself right back into it again by getting married a fourth time to actress Darcy LaPierre in February of 1994, just weeks before shooting began after which it was soon announced that she was pregnant, Van Damme's third child. Not long after that, during production, Van Damme had an affair with Kylie Minogue, made even more awkward by the fact that LaPierre was on set, cameoing as a date for Guile in one scene. You may wonder how any man could have the energy to keep up with all of that in his personal life and his job. The answer, as it turns out, is quite simple. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. <laughs> As D'Souza claimed in a 2018 interview with The Guardian, Van Damme was absolutely coked out of his mind. It was said that he spent about $10,000 a week on his habit. No wonder why his price tag was so high. As with other challenging actors in the past, the production hired a handler to keep Van Damme under control and prevent him from getting into trouble. It proved completely ineffective, as Van Damme was out on the streets of Thailand and Australia almost every night. The production lost many hours and ultimately days from Van Damme suffering from whatever he had done the night before, or simply disappearing. Roshan Seth, who plays Dalsim in the film, claimed there were times Van Damme would just not show up for the entire day. He would send a message to producers claiming that he needed more time to pump his muscles, and then that would be it. No more shots that day. The diva attitude of the film's main star made the upcoming deadline for the film's premiere all the more daunting, but to his immense credit, D'Souza pressed on. Through the constant changes requested by Capcom, and when issues of illnesses arose on set, he pressed on. When cast and crew discovered the local Bangkok massage parlors, and reportedly left the set multiple times a day to get worked on, he pressed on. When Thai officials wouldn't allow the production to use airspace for its final attack on Bison's compound, D'Souza again pressed on, rewriting the scene so the attack would be by boat. When a power outage would potentially delay filming for two weeks, D'Souza moved the production to Australia ahead of schedule to shoot the unfinished scenes. The man constantly pressed on until filming was finally completed. Post-production still presented a decent amount of issues. Editing had to be done very quickly to meet Capcom's December 23rd deadline, so some elements fell by the wayside, the most notable of which was the Hadouken. Hadouken! 
The fan favorite move in the video game was originally going to appear on screen just as it did in the game, with a blue fireball launching from the hands of Ryu. But with the lack of post-production time, the film just ended up with some sort of flash when the moment came. <laughs> Fans were understandably quite disappointed. They were also disappointed in the action itself, as it appeared lazy, unrehearsed, and unrealistic. The lack of realism in the fighting sequences came from the editing process as well. All parties involved had agreed the rating would be PG-13, but D'Souza's initial cut came back with an R rating. He quickly struggled to remove any traces of blood and any action that was too graphic. Like for example, Vega getting killed by being impaled on his own glove. Yes, that was supposed to be in there. After the action was cut into oblivion, D'Souza turned the film back in only to have it receive a G rating. Clearly, he took the cutting too far. D'Souza shot one final scene where Guile proclaims, Four years of ROTC for this shit to get the rating back up to PG-13, and it worked. Finally, on December 23, 1994, Street Fighter was released. It grossed $9.5 million on its opening weekend. In its full theatrical run, it would go on to collect $33 million at the domestic box office, and nearly $100 million worldwide. Despite the financial success, the film was panned by critics and fans alike. Street Fighter currently holds a 10% average on Rotten Tomatoes. The New York Times called it a dreary, overstuffed hodgepodge of poorly edited martial arts sequences and often unintelligible dialogue. Leonard Maltin gave the film his lowest rating, stating that even Jean-Claude Van Damme fans couldn't rationalize this bomb. There were once rumors of a sequel in the early 2000s that would have seen Van Damme share the screen with his fellow 80s superstar Dolph Lundgren. For whatever reason, that project never got off the ground. The Street Fighter franchise was briefly revisited on screen with 2009's Street Fighter The Legend of Chun-Li. When the film was being shot, Van Damme was actually offered a cameo as Colonel Guile. The studio insisted that the film would be better than the first foray on the big screen. Van Damme wisely declined the offer. For all of the negative things one could say about Van Damme during this film, he would ultimately agree sobering up was the best thing he could have done for his career. After getting clean, Van Damme would look back at this time in his career, the affairs, the drugs, the superior attitude, with tremendous regret. He even regretted taking this role in the film, though you couldn't read that on his face at the time. When the film premiered and Van Damme hit the red carpet, he was all smiles. So was the entire cast, with one glaring omission. By the time Street Fighter hit theaters, Raul Julia had passed away. No one in the cast was aware that Julia's cancer was terminal. The months of shooting Street Fighter ended up being the final months of Julia's life. He came to the production right after his chemotherapy treatment and played the role to the best of his ability. After gaining weight back, he commanded the screen in every scene he was in. He was often seen looking tired on set, but as soon as D'Souza called for action, Raul Julia would come to life and deliver a classic performance. Even with all that going on, he refused to use a body double, doing his own stunts. That's him in every shot. A lot of people questioned why an actor that took himself so seriously would star in a movie like Street Fighter, as it may ruin his reputation in Hollywood, or make him appear less serious about his career. The answer was simple. His children were fans of the video game. Julian knew that his time was short, and making Street Fighter, which many considered beneath his talents, was a love letter to his children. In the early 1990s, video games grew in popularity thanks to consoles like the Nintendo Entertainment System and Sega Genesis. Hollywood, not wanting to leave money on the table, saw a chance to mine these popular game titles for the big screen. The first video game adaptation, Super Mario Bros., was seen as an almost can't-miss opportunity but it was released in 1993 to horrible reviews and lackluster box office. The next two video game movies, Double Dragon and Street Fighter, didn't fare that much better. Uh, I was wrong, it got worse. Audiences quickly became apprehensive about whether Hollywood could translate their favorite games into immersive theatrical adventures. We can all go home. And then, on August 18th, 1995, a new anticipated video game adaptation hit the big screen, Mortal Kombat. It had an untested yet dedicated director, and a cast full of virtually unknown performers, and one Highlander. <laughs> so how did Mortal Kombat turn the tide of video game movies from seemingly dead in the water to a massively lucrative genre? Get over here! And find out what the f*** happened to this movie. In the year 1991, the video game landscape was a more family-friendly environment, with favorites like Super Mario and The Legend of Zelda dominating TV screens. Around that time, game development company Midway was looking to make more mature content for their adult customers. Enter the producers of the action movie Universal Soldier, who approached Midway about making a video game based off their upcoming release, potentially using the digitized likeness of star Jean-Claude Van Damme. 
when that deal eventually fell through, game designers Ed Boon and John Tobias began contemplating a more gritty martial arts fighting game inspired by one of Van Damme's other notable movies, Bloodsport. When Capcom's Street Fighter II became a gigantic arcade hit, Midway authorized Boon and Tobias to create their own original arcade fighting game. Armed with creative freedom, the duo set their sights on the first character, Johnny Cage, who was meant to be a direct send-up of the larger-than-life personality that was Jean-Claude Van Damme. Another influence was director John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China and how it Americanized supernatural kung fu movies from China. The first Mortal Kombat game arrived in arcades in October of 1992, and it immediately gained notoriety for its radically violent gameplay. So of course, the next logical step was to get it into the homes of gamers. On September 13, 1993, dubbed Mortal Monday, the game was released on four home consoles. However, not all versions were created equal. Nintendo, with its family focus, released theirs without any bloodshed, while Sega allowed the carnage, but only if you knew the secret code. A-B-A-C-A-B-B, -A, -B -B, a reference to an album and song title from rock band Genesis. Movie producer Lawrence Kazanov thought Mortal Kombat was like Star Wars meets Enter the Dragon, and he pursued the rights, insisting he could turn the property into a global sensation. And after several months, he finally convinced the game makers and set about turning this fighting game with very little story into a huge Hollywood film. Several directors with prominent filmographies submitted pitches for their take on the material, but it was a chance screening of an independent film called Shopping, featuring a young Jude Law, that got the producers excited. Impressed with the low-budget storytelling, the producers invited director Paul W.S. Anderson to hear his pitch. Anderson had been a massive fan of the Mortal Kombat game and was eager to impress the producers, but he lacked the knowledge of big-budget studio filmmaking. So, prior to the meeting, he purchased every book he could find on CGI and special effects. The producers later said that Anderson sounded like the most intelligent, well-versed person in Hollywood when it came to CGI, when he was really just regurgitating what he had read. But it clearly worked, and Paul W.S. Anderson was hired to direct his first major studio picture. The original Mortal Kombat script was written in the R-rated vein of the infamously gory games, but studio executives demanded a PG-13 rating, so the movie could be seen by the younger audiences who had made the game such a smash hit. This resulted in the producers actually working with the MPAA to find out what specific material would earn an R rating versus a PG-13, and they learned that the on-screen deaths of human characters was the primary determining factor. When the softer PG-13 script by writer Kevin Droney made it to the game creators Ed Boon and John Tobias, they were not impressed, believing it had too much comedy, especially for the serious mentor character Raiden. <laughs> And the head of New Line Cinema hated the script so much, he reportedly screamed at Kazanov for an hour, before ultimately telling him, now go ahead and make it. Flawless victory. With the studio and director on board, it was time to cast the combatants for the tournament between Earth and the realm of Outworld. The filmmakers had seen dailies from the Jim Carrey movie The Mask, and were blown away by a young Cameron Diaz, and they immediately grabbed her to play Sonya Blade. But when Diaz injured her wrist during training and had to bow out late in the process, that turned out to be a lucky break for Bridget Wilson, who had previously auditioned for the role but was passed over. Wilson was on her final day of shooting on Adam Sandler's Billy Madison when she got the call for the part, which required her to be on set the very next day. Robin Shu, who had built a solid reputation in Hong Kong as a martial artist and stuntman, had originally laughed at the idea of a Mortal Kombat movie, but was convinced by a friend to audition. It would take seven auditions before he finally landed the role of bicycle-kicking hero Liu Kang. The producers wanted to cast Jean-Claude Van Damme in the role that was literally created for him, Johnny Cage. However, at the time, Van Damme was already signed to star in a different video game adaptation, Street Fighter. Now, who wants to go home? And who wants to go with me? So they turned their focus to another person with martial arts in his blood, Brandon Lee. The producers felt that Lee was on the precipice of the A-list, and thought casting the son of the legendary Bruce Lee would be perfect for their martial arts project that was so obviously influenced by Enter the Dragon. Sadly, as those discussions were happening, Brandon Lee was tragically killed while making The Crow. The role of the smug action star instead went to relatively unknown actor Lyndon Ashby, who had just appeared as Morgan Earp in Kevin Costner's western Wyatt Earp. Originally, Sean Connery was approached to play Lord Raiden, but he turned them down, saying at the time he simply wanted to golf. 
So they approached his fellow immortal, Christopher Lambert, for the role, which was met with some controversy for whitewashing a character of Asian descent. Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa would play sadistic sorcerer Shang Tsung, a performance that is now often considered the quintessential version of the villain. Noted video game fan Steven Spielberg nearly made a cameo as the director of Johnny Cage's movie, but when the busy filmmaker was suddenly unavailable, a Spielberg doppelganger was quickly cast instead. Production on Mortal Kombat began in August of 1994. On the very first day of filming, it became apparent that Paul W.S. Anderson was inexperienced directing this type of action when he attempted to shoot an entire long fight sequence in a wide master shot, calling for take after take. Eventually, Robin Shu, who was familiar with fight scenes from his Hong Kong work, explained how coverage and close-ups are used and edited to create a full final fight sequence. Anderson was incredibly thankful for the first day encounter because it put him at ease to know he was working with people who were supportive and understanding of his rookie shortcomings. This extended to the biggest name on the production, Christopher Lambert, who many cast members looked up to on the set. Because he was having such a good time and just going with the flow, everyone else followed suit. Most interior shots were captured in Los Angeles, but Anderson wanted something unique for the exterior shots, and that meant traveling around the globe to Thailand. However, the locations they used were difficult to access, requiring the cast and crew to travel back and forth from the mainland each day via long canoe, including all the gear for the shoot. With Lambert the most seasoned member of the cast, and therefore the highest paid, the production could only afford him for the few weeks of Los Angeles shooting. Anderson figured he could get all the necessary close-ups of Lambert in LA, and then use a double in Thailand for the wide shots. But when Anderson explained this plan to Lambert, the actor laughed and demonstrated his commitment by paying for his own flight and accommodations in Thailand, even funding the rap party himself. While filming, Anderson allowed his actors to improvise dialogue, resulting in more comedic one-liners like Johnny Cage's quip, Those are $500 sunglasses, asshole. It seems not everyone was a fan of this. Lyndon Ashby later ran into screenwriter Kevin Droney at a party, and the writer introduced the actor to his girlfriend by saying, This is the asshole that ruined my script. Ashby just laughed and let it slide, apparently without delivering his character's signature crotch punch. Of course, a production of this magnitude was not without its problems, but in this case, the diva on set was not Johnny Cage, or in fact, any of the humans. It was Goro, the $1 million four-armed animatronic, which continually malfunctioned and caused constant delays to production. With the cast performing many of their own stunts, injuries were also an issue, including Lyndon Ashby bruising a kidney in his fight with Scorpion, and Bridget Wilson dislocating her shoulder before getting it popped back into place and continuing on with the scene. In his fight with Reptile, Robin Shu fractured his ribs and didn't tell anyone at the time, instead quietly requesting his on-screen adversary to only hit him on his left side. Speaking of that Reptile fight, it actually wasn't in the original cut of the film, along with several other clashes. After the first test audience screenings, the comments were unanimous. It was good enough, but short on action and missing iconic finishing moves from the video game. So the cast and crew reconvened to shoot more fight scenes, with Robin Shu stepping in as the fight coordinator. When Mortal Kombat was released in theaters on August 18, 1995, that fight choreography would be one of the main things to receive a positive response. The movie opened in first place with over $23 million and remained on top for three consecutive weeks, making it the first truly successful video game adaptation. Out of fear that the film would bomb, Anderson had spent the opening weekend vacationing in Hawaii, and upon learning of its success, he regretted not being in Los Angeles to take full advantage of having the biggest movie in the country. Critics hailed it as the best video game adaptation to date, although at the time that was shallow praise given the competition. You'll have to do better than that, okay? They also appreciated the set design and fights, but found the script lacking and the acting subpar. Audiences disagreed, giving the film a respectable A- cinema score, and pushing the box office total to $122 million on a budget of $20 million. One thing fans and critics did seem to agree on was that the film should have had an R rating. Many felt the end product was watered down, and not a true representation of the video game that was so profusely violent it forced the creation of the Entertainment Software Ratings Board. And there was that incredible soundtrack. For the original video game, producers had approached Lords of Acid musicians Praga Khan and Olivier Adams to develop music. As the new group, The Immortals, they came up with one of the most iconic theme songs ever created. Mortal Kombat! 
When it came time to put together the music for the film, producers were laughed at when they pitched a pure electronic dance music soundtrack. Sony Music wanted to do a Buckethead vs. Eddie Van Halen style soundtrack, and Virgin Records pitched a Janet Jackson vibe. New Line ultimately backed the producer's dreams of an EDM score and sold the rights to a small record company. The gamble paid off, and the soundtrack album became the first ever platinum-selling EDM record. The first Mortal Kombat movie ends on a cliffhanger, with the heroes in fighting stance to face the dreaded emperor of Outworld, Shao Kahn. When the sequel, Mortal Kombat Annihilation, arrived in November 1997, it picked up directly where its predecessor left off. But something about it just seemed slightly off. Maybe the camera angles? Different color grading? Or perhaps that most of the actors were completely recast? Lyndon Ashby was excited to reprise his role for a sequel, but understandably changed his mind upon learning that Johnny Cage would be killed off in the first 10 minutes. Bridget Wilson turned it down to appear in I Know What You Did Last Summer. Even though Christopher Lambert absolutely loved making the first film, he thought the sequel script was terrible and instead chose to split his time between French films and low-budget movies like Mean Guns. While Paul W.S. Anderson was interested in returning to direct the sequel, at the time he was already committed to Event Horizon. For his next video game adaptation, Resident Evil, he signed on with the goal of seeing the series through till the end, unlike what had happened with Mortal Kombat. After five Resident Evil sequels and a reboot, he was obviously true to his word. Three decades later, the world of Mortal Kombat has endured with two dozen games, plus comics, TV series, animated videos, and even a live stage show. Paul W.S. Anderson's 1995 feature adaptation may have its detractors, but its impact on the industry cannot be understated. Sure, some of the CGI is dated, and the dialogue can be cringeworthy. All those souls, and you still don't have one of your own. But it was also one of the first Hollywood movies to embrace Hong Kong-style wire work and fight choreography, which subsequent films like The Matrix no doubt took inspiration from. Even the games still pay homage to the original movie, with most of the main cast recently providing their voices and likenesses for added content in Mortal Kombat 11. Perhaps most significantly, even after all the time and competition since it first hit theaters, Mortal Kombat is still considered one of the best video game movies. Admittedly, it's not exactly a high bar, but it still counts as an achievement. Fatality. And the Mortal Kombat franchise just keeps on kicking. Despite the global pandemic, the 2021 R-rated reboot performed well enough at the box office and on HBO Max to demand a sequel being headed up by Moon Knight showrunner Jeremy Slater. We are eagerly anticipating it, if for no other reason than it will give us an excuse to go back and watch the original again. I guess you knew it would end this way. Didn't have a clue. 